two concrete trees. Uh, the artist I couldn't find uh, on a plaque anywhere, but these two concrete trees uh, summed up for me very precisely the notion of German romanticism of the early 19th century. The famous German artist, uh, Kaspar David Frederick, um, he uh, has uh, bare trees in very many of his pictures, often with ruins. And it seems to me remarkable that we now have these um, romantic trees uh, on the Shrine of the Books um, uh, plateau, uh, just uh, near the Knesset building. This is Romanticism writ large. Yigel Yadin, the famous general deputy prime minister at one point, and also uh, a Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, professor of archeology span at the Hebrew University, uh, wrote in 1957, I cannot avoid the feeling that there is something symbolic in the discovery of the scrolls and their acquisition at the moment of the creation of the state of Israel. It is as if these manuscripts had been waiting for 2000 years, ever since the destruction of Israel's independence, until the people of Israel had returned to their home and regained their freedom. This symbolism is heightened by the fact that the first three scrolls were bought by my father for Israel on the 29th of November, 1947, the very day on which the United Nations voted for the recreation of the Jewish state in Israel after 2000 years. It was a tremendously exciting experience, difficult to convey in words, to see the original scrolls and to study them, knowing that some of the biblical manuscripts were copied only a few hundred years after their composition, and that these very scrolls were read and studied by our forefathers in the period of the Second Temple. They constitute a vital link, long lost and now regained, between those ancient times so rich in civilized thought in the present day, an Israeli and a Jew, can find nothing more deeply moving than the study of manuscripts written by the people of the book in the land of the book more than 2000 years ago. So what is it that is so deeply moving about looking at these scrolls? What might they mean within the context of modern Judaism? I'm not sure I can answer my own question, but I think we need to move beyond simply appreciating the scrolls in this romantic, iconic fashion. So let me first of all, uh, in moving to a second point, try and reintroduce you to the scrolls uh, as they have become um, more deeply appreciated in the last uh, decade or so. Um, you should be familiar more or less with where they come from. They come from a range of places from Wadi Dalie, just north of Jericho, down as far south as Masada, mostly in the Judean wilderness in the Dead Sea region, hence their name. So several sites in the Judean region have produced manuscripts 1947, since 1947. And as a whole, these finds date from the fourth century uh, BCE. In fact, we have some very important manuscripts uh, in Aramaic from Wadi Dalie, which uh, uh, are manuscripts containing Jewish contracts, um, but they are sealed with Greek seals which predate Alexander the Great, already suggesting the strength of Hellenistic influence in the area. Um, a remarkable uh, discovery. And there are a few manuscripts that belong to the Arab period, to the Islamic period, but most of the scrolls from the Judean wilderness are Jewish compositions 
from before the Second Revolt. And the largest group of these come from 11 caves at and near Qumran on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea here. And most of you will be familiar with uh, the Qumran site. Uh, this picture perhaps not as clear as it, as it might be, but the, the Qumran site is on this terrace uh, here on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea, uh, which you can see um, lying here. And this is a photograph from the other angle looking down into Wadi Qumran uh, with the Qumran site just nearby. What's intriguing is that the caves where manuscripts were found are of two types. Uh, there are some up in the foothills which are natural caves and there are some such as you can see here of cave four which are man-made caves and uh, uh, it's um, important uh, for us in our discussions to recognize what kind of cave uh, the manuscripts were found in. This is a virtual reconstruction of Qumran, um, which is probably impossible, uh, given that this uh, part of the terrace has been extensively excavated and there's been no vegetable matter found there at all. So almost certainly no trees uh, uh, at this site. They would have taken too much water. Um, but um, that's part of the romantic view of Qumran as well, uh, that it was uh, covered with trees. Uh, so what about these Qumran scrolls? We have uh, at Qumran in these 11 caves, um, an ideologically consistent library or collection or archive, however we call it, uh, of nearly a thousand manuscripts, mostly in fragments. Uh, the Qumran caves of two sorts, as I've mentioned, natural and man-made, have varying functions. Perhaps they're akin to a Geniza in some respects. Perhaps cave one is in that category, uh, a sort of burial place for used manuscripts. Maybe one or more of the caves represents a personal collection of texts that was brought to Qumran and deposited there by somebody either visiting or joining the, the community. Uh, in cave seven, all the manuscripts are in Greek and that might represent a specialist collection, but not exclusively so. There are Greek manuscripts also in cave four. Uh, cave four itself perhaps is a working repository. So we can already feel that rather than just thinking of the Dead Sea Scrolls as a single group of um, manuscripts that we need to be differentiating between types of manuscript. Recognizing too that most were not actually written at Qumran but were brought there from elsewhere by people who were visiting or joining the community. The scrolls uh, from the 11 caves can be dated to between the mid third century BCE which is at least a century and a half before the Qumran site was occupied by the community that lived there, uh, and the mid first century CE, the site being destroyed by the Romans in 68 uh, CE as they came down the Jordan Valley and then turned right to go to the siege Jerusalem. Uh, of these thousand or so manuscripts, 25% or so represent the life of the community or communities associated with Qumran and other sites in the Judean region. Uh, often this community is understood to be the Essenes. 50% represent other Jewish compositions from the Second Temple period. Um, that is at least half of the collection is general Jewish literature. Nothing sectarian, nothing to be marginalized, but general Jewish literature, Hillel's bedtime reading. And about 25% are what we might call biblical manuscripts, but in inverted commas, because there was no firm 
uh, idea of Bible or Tanakh at this time. And they're written on various materials. So what's the significance here that we might take forwards uh, in our attempt to incorporate the scrolls into modern Jewish thinking? Well, the scrolls are the major source material in Hebrew and Aramaic for Judea at the time of the Hasmoneans, Herod and Hillel. At this pivotal period between uh, the time of uh, the scriptures and the time of the Mishnah. They give us um, the principal evidence for how we might link the two. And that link uh, can be important for how we engage with the uh, long history of Jewish traditions. They help us think about similarities and differences between the main groups in Judaism at the time and also between Second Temple and later forms of Judaism. And within these different groups, we can also discern now Jews with multiple identities. And I hope that you can hear in this second point resonances for how uh, modern Judaism itself is structured, formed with multiple groups and within those groups, all kinds of multiple identities. They show us some features of pre-Mishnaic Judaism that might be worth reinstating. So my third point is, let's see how the scrolls challenge our view of modeling Judaism. Uh, what is Judaism? Well, most scholars who have written about the scrolls in the first generation or the first 50 years, we might say, since they were discovered in 1947, have relied upon Josephus for their starting point, engaging with the dominant uh, consensus view that the scrolls were pulled together um, by the Essenes, represented here uh, with Josephus's view of the group as Essene. Uh, Josephus also describes Pharisees and Sadducees and a fourth philosophy, effectively giving us a model of Judaism, which is that its elites are distinct groups which don't overlap with one another, barely engage with one another. Uh, and it seems that historians have been very much tempted to adopt Josephus without critical evaluation, adding to his picture uh, some Christian groups and Gnostics, and then you can put in other groups in your own green boxes here. Now, is this fair? to how we should model Judaism, that it is made up of distinct groups with no overlapping interests. Some would say, no, um, we can hold on to something of distinct groups and then allow for different varied colors within each group. Um, this multiple identity that can be found in any group of people, Jewish or not. But I still think that uh, doesn't go far enough in presenting an appropriate model either for ancient or for modern Judaism. Uh, rather, the model which I think has more resonance for uh, the late Second Temple period and even for today is a model based on a um, Venn diagram where we have something of a common core which in some periods might be larger and other periods smaller. And then certain features which can identify people as belonging to one community rather than another. Uh, and there are many and multiple overlaps between the different groups. Um, so, it seems to me that uh, in recent times, we've moved away 
from Josephus, who is writing largely for non-Jews and therefore highlighting the differences that there are between Jewish groups to make things clear, towards a model much more like this, which gives us a sense that in fact, the multiplicity, the complexity of modern Judaism actually is as old as can be. And as I say, within each of those groups that might be identified, there are multiple identities. The teacher of the sectarian scrolls has a number of different features. He's difficult to pin down. Some people think that he may be even a figment of some scribe's imagination. Uh, in some texts, he seems to be a sage, a wise man. In others, akin to a prophet, though uh, the term Navi is never actually used of him. He's an interpreter of scripture, a man of prayer, if he's identified with at least part of the Hodayot, um, the text that sat behind Stephen Fry. He's a poet then. One text names him as a priest. And certainly in some of his interpretations of Torah, he is a religious purist. And community members variously reflect those different features and one could add others. Some of them having leanings towards mysticism uh, or what we might label magical practices. Um, but certainly we have texts in the library which reflect this full range of identities. Multiple identities uh, has become a particular feature of uh, modern um, self-understanding. Uh, one way I think of it often is with this wonderful um, bean, which uh, is known to, um, officially as, as Cloudgate by uh, Anish Kapoor uh, in Chicago, uh, a fantastic uh, sculpture. But if you go underneath it to engage with its navel, you will discover yourself reflected in multiple ways. Uh, you can't be a single entity. You are made up of all different kinds of relationships and so on and interests. And it's this complexity which now uh, infects how we understand the scrolls and I think makes them much more interesting as a way in which we can engage with modern Judaism as well. They're much more like ourselves than we might think. A fourth point, the scrolls encourage us to rethink Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible and its interpretation. And what I mean here just very quickly is that when I consider uh, Jewish understandings of the Bible, I take as my premise, my assumption, that uh, all Jews wish to engage with scripture, but they do it naturally through the tradition in some way or other, either the tradition of prayer or the tradition of study um, through commentary and so on. And that is uh, a remarkable phenomenon. Uh, but what we learn uh, from the scrolls is that actually the texts of uh, the Hebrew Bible themselves are a mixture of scripture and commentary, giving us insight into um, the way in which texts are transmitted such that the modern approach, which might suggest that scripture all belongs in the past and we dig back through the tradition of commentary towards it, um, is perhaps only part of the story. And that is a story which uh, has scripture as something vital, which is represented in each generation 
in intriguing ways. Certainly for the Bible, uh, we have a general continuity um, of the Hebrew text with that which is presented in rabbinic Bibles, but no copy of any biblical book at Qumran agrees with later rabbinic Bibles letter for letter. It's almost as if we're being told that the letter of scripture is not as important as the overall text, the meaning, the identity of a biblical book uh, and its message. Uh, and that's also a very important lesson for the modern period uh, because it queries certain fundamentalist attitudes to texts uh, that they um, perhaps are misconstruing things if they um, seek to pay too much attention to the letter. How do we know, in fact, if a particular manuscript is actually a copy of a biblical book or, if you like, an authoritative version of a text? They come in so many different shapes and sizes in the Qumran library. You can actually have great fun scrolling through the Isaiah scroll uh, on the web pages of the Shrine of the Book, which is based on the uh, website of the Israel Museum. Do go and play with it. Um, the Isaiah scroll is one of the most intriguing of scrolls. People still don't know really how important it should or might be. Now the Torah is dominant in the Qumran corpus of scrolls um, and um, publication of the scriptural manuscripts alongside numerous pieces of legal interpretation has given rise to a large industry nowadays among scholars tracing continuities and discontinuities between the scrolls and rabbinic works. But as I mentioned, uh, there is this variety of text form. Intriguingly, some manuscripts contain Genesis and Exodus, Bereshit and Shemot. Uh, one contains Exodus and Leviticus. Some contain Leviticus and Numbers, uh, but none contain Numbers and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy seems to have been a freestanding book. And this raises some very interesting questions about how the Torah was presented uh, either in study or in worship contexts. Um, Deuteronomy seems to have been uh, the book that controlled part of the ideology of this group uh, in particular, but perhaps its freestanding character is common within Judaism at the time. We only have uh, the one book title. Now, let me just give you one example of the kinds of things I'm talking about here. This manuscript is known as 4Q Genesis G. Um, it's the Gth copy of Genesis from the fourth K. And it's a very uh, beautifully written text, as you can see here on the image. Um, but is this manuscript scriptural? Well, the question is set to tease. In the presentation of Genesis chapter one, verse five, in the Masoretic text in the rabbinic Bibles, which is of course the basis of most English translations, we read, and God called the light day. But in 4Q Genesis G, we read that he called the light Yomam, daytime or daylight. Uh, and this is a tradition which is followed in the Aramaic Targumim uniformly. Now, does that mean that what we have in 4Q Genesis G is actually an interpretation? What it seems to be uh, what seems to be happening is that the scribe of this manuscript uh, is introducing a second mame in order to distinguish yom, day, as daytime from yom, day, that is, 
day one, day two, day three in the pattern of creation. Has he created then a text which is non-biblical, which is simply an interpretation? Well, I think the question, the proposal of putting it that way is inappropriate. Rather, we have something that in indicative that scribes took very seriously their role in transmitting texts and sought to clarify in many instances, the way in which the text might be appropriated by readers. Um, here, sorting out a problem. Now the scholars get themselves very confused about all of this. James Davila, who was the official editor of this manuscript, simply concluded at the end of his description of this textual variant, that this is likely to be a scribal error. It's possible that the alteration arose from a dittography of the main in an early manuscript or one written even in Paleo-Hebrew script. So he reckons that here we have a scribal error. More recently, Ronald Hendel, who's the chief editor of a new edition of the Hebrew Bible, has argued that indeed the reading is secondary and probably we could all agree on that. Um, it's a late biblical Hebrew usage, he says, meaning not by day as it does in uh, classical biblical Hebrew, but daytime. And he can suggests that this uh, is an Aramaism that has been introduced into the text, an Aramaism which we can then see represented in the Targumic tradition. This revision, he says, disambiguates the meaning of Yom, which can mean a whole day or daytime, as in English and other languages. Daytime clarifies the obvious contextual sense of Yom, its first instance in 1.5, whereas Yom 2, the second instance, refers to something which is the whole day. So he's understanding this as an Aramaic borrowing, which is explanatory, and as explanation is secondary. But I wonder whether somebody hearing this text would actually appreciate, oh yes, this is secondary, this is explanatory. I don't think so. I think they would hear the text of scripture and the clarification would simply be received, would be heard. So what we end up with is, uh, there are hundreds of examples like this in the scrolls, that we have to learn new things about how Jews composed and transmitted texts and traditions. And these new things are very liberating. We can appreciate variety, fluidity, vitality, development. All of that was already known about, of course, because of the Greek Jewish translation. But now, in light of these manuscripts, it can be appreciated freshly. The scribes were generally not rigid copyists but active participants in the transmission process. And I think the Jewish community uh, generally nowadays needs to rediscover its own responsibility in how it transmits authoritative text and tradition in its own time, in its own way. And the scrolls might prompt uh, some better self-understanding in that direction. Bible interpretation then is actually taking place within the text of scripture. And it's taking place every time there is a performance of the text. I think this can be widely recognized both in modern times 
and increasingly we are recognizing it in ancient times as well. The production of texts is a much more complex affair than has often been thought. And scripture interpretation takes multiple forms. It's not simply halakhic or haggadic, uh, but is present in many different ways. Uh, and these are represented in the scrolls uh, in very interesting uh, fashions. The methods of interpretation are open to anybody who reads or hears the text. And that is how people can assess whether or not they wish to accept the text as having some kind of authority in the community as they hear it. Indeed, in the Qumran group, some interpreters were even considered to be inspired. Uh, amongst the types of interpretation are legal interpretation, exhortatory interpretation, us usually uh, using uh, traditions about the past to create ethical points, prophetic interpretation, showing how unfulfilled scriptural texts are fulfilled in the present, and then there are types of implicit interpretation as well, including uh, narrative interpretation, some Haggadic uh, elements, which are contained within the retelling of scriptural stories without necessarily being explicitly identified as such. And then there is the scriptural interpretation that we find in much poetry and wisdom material. Uh, this is an example of a uh, text from the Damascus document, which we have now in multiple copies in cave four at Qumran, but in its most complete form um, from the Cairo Geniza, where you can see scripture is cited explicitly and texts are juxtaposed to create an interpretation, which is a principle that um, if you are divorced, you cannot remarry uh, because you would be um, effectively taking uh, a second wife while the first is alive. There are other ways of interpreting the text as well. My fifth point is to remind folk about some remarkable women in the scrolls. Um, I don't know how many women there are amongst the officers of the JRC, but uh, there are certainly some remarkable women in antiquity, and perhaps we need a few more around in the um, uh, structures and institutions of Judaism in the modern period. Uh, in the Genesis Apocryphon, this Aramaic text, which you can see here, has a very particular kind of ink that has almost eaten its way through the scroll. We read of Sarah. How come uh, there was this problem in Genesis uh, that she was abducted for the Pharaoh? Well, of course, she was extremely beautiful. Um, but most importantly, notice at the bottom of this paragraph, with all this beauty, she possesses abundant wisdom, so that whatever she does is perfect. In a manuscript initially labeled as a reworked Pentateuch, but now considered to be a form of Torah itself, we find in the book of Exodus that Miriam, rather than repeating the song which Moses and the boys have sung when they've crossed the sea, uh, she has her own song. And uh, it uh, has some phraseology which echoes the song that the boys have sung, but it assigns greatness to God in what he has done in rescuing Israel through the mighty waters. Um, in a way, if you like, it seems almost as if the boys take the credit, uh, but the girls give the credit to God, uh, something of 
perhaps greater spiritual insight. Now, what's happened here? Uh, well, Miriam clearly had her own song uh, in this version of the Torah. Um, was it chopped out by the final redactors of Exodus, the editors of Exodus, who said, no, we can't have girls with their own voice uh, in this text? Or is it secondary that at some later stage in the passing uh, of the tradition, uh, we now find in the book of Exodus that somebody decided the women should have a voice of their own. Um, it's probably the latter, but uh, the first option is a possibility. And it's intriguing that we have in the book of Judith, a victory song associated with women, um, perhaps uh, a parallel to what is presented here in the Song of Miriam. So there may be some hints here of a very long process in the transmission of the book of Exodus, which we're only just beginning to become aware of. This is a very intriguing fragment from a text known as Instruction on Musa le Mevin, the uh, discipline of the, the disciple. And in this fragment, the pronouns are all feminine. Uh, so the implication is that the student who is being instructed by the wise teacher in this text is a woman. Um, now, some people have claimed that actually this is instruction to men as to what they should tell the women when they go home. Mm. Uh, learn this by heart and then repeat it to your wife or daughter when you go home. But perhaps there really were women in school. Um, and what about this? This is the first text we have dealing with the problem of the mother-in-law. Um, so a realization of social, the social fabric of the Jewish community in the second temple period. You will become one with the wife of your bosom for she is the flesh of your nakedness and whoever has ruled over her apart from you has changed the boundary of his life. Um, so once a uh, girl is married, he is, she is separated from her mother and towards you will be her longing. She will be one flesh for you. So mother-in-law, keep your distance in the new situation. In the congregation uh, referred to in one of the sectarian compositions, we also learn about women who are taught the precepts of the covenant and have everything expanded or interpreted to them. That is the interpretations of the Torah that are found in the statutes of the community so that they might not stray in their errors. And this is that particular manuscript. A little later in the same text, the woman is permitted to be called as a witness in a judgment uh, in the community. Uh, this was so um, problematic for early readers of the scrolls that the text was amended and the female forms of the verb uh, were turned into male forms because people simply didn't believe that women could testify in antiquity. Uh, but I think we need to read the text as it is and see that women could be instructed, women could have a place in the community as mothers um, and so forth. Uh, I'll skip over this particular text because I want to get to my last point, which is that there is some wonderful 
um, prayer and poetry in the scrolls, uh, which perhaps can become part of modern Jewish uh, practice as well. I'm particularly uh, find appealing um, the uh, reform Siddur, which is available online. And in its introductory materials, it has many quotations uh, to encourage you to uh, have some good thoughts before you set out on your prayer journey for the day or for Shabbat. And uh, what is intriguing is that there is virtually nothing which is pre-Mishnaic in these um, wise words uh, in the introductory materials of the Siddur. Now, of course, the Siddurim take many different forms and shapes uh, in Jewish communities. And um, so there is but one quotation uh, and that from Philo on this page 14. What are our places of prayer, but schools of prudence, courage, temperance, and justice of piety, holiness, and virtue. Uh, there are no references to any of the insights about prayer uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. What a shame. And surely uh, reform Judaism could take a lead on this, if not other communities. Um, well, in some ways, what's important is that this community collects a large number of prayer texts uh, together. Not least possibly because the community praying in various forms in various groups around the Judean region, but largely and probably most commonly apart from the temple which of course is also the modern setting. Thinking of itself as a mikdash adam, as one of the texts says, a human sanctuary. And in such sanctuary, taking care to write its prayers down, to scripturalize its prayers. Rather nicely put over in this image by Lee Katov for the translation of the Temple Scroll, in which you can see a, um, a symbol of the menorah, but also the scribe at work writing his prayers down. And prayer texts at Qumran are amongst the most common uh, part of the library, both in terms of um, manuscript copies of the books of Psalms, and here you can see a copy of um, the Psalms from the 4K, 4Q Psalms B, laid out in stichometric half lines in poetry. Um, here, a beautiful copy just of Psalm 119, the Psalm which extols the Torah. Um, and the scribe is moving here from the uh, He verse to the Vav verse. Um, this was probably a pocket edition, or this beautiful sheet of the 11Q Psalms A scroll. Uh, and you can see that the divine name in this particular manuscript is represented in Paleo Hebrew. You can see the writing clearly in, in uh, several places. The Tetragrammaton is um, being written in that way, possibly to avoid any um, risk of it being pronounced as the scroll was, was read out. There are lots of uh, Psalms, scrolls, lots of poems uh, in the uh, scrolls which we could take account of. And several scrolls contain many Psalms that were previously unknown, some associated pseudepigraphically with historical figures like Manasseh. Uh, how were all these Psalms used? by this community or by its individual members? We really don't know the answer to that question, but certainly these people, they weren't just interested in a fairly strict interpretation of the law in their daily life, but they had an extremely rich uh, prayer life. 
which uh, um, comes across in a number of their different texts. And so let me conclude just by reading you a couple of these. Uh, this is um, the psalm which uh, we've known before in Syriac, uh, Psalm 154 in the Peshitta. With a loud voice glorify God in the congregation of the many proclaim his glory in the multitude of the upright glorify his name and with the faithful tell of his greatness join your souls with the good and with the pure to glorify the most high God join yourselves together to make known his salvation and do not be slow in making known his strength and his majesty to all the simple uh, from the gates of the righteous is heard her her voice and from the congregation of the pious her song when they eat their fill uh, she is cited and when they drink together in community, their meditation is on the Torah of the Most High and their speech is to make known his strength. You see, singing the praise of the Torah is something you do when you eat together. Uh, this is just brilliant and fantastic. Bless the Lord who redeems the poor from the hand of strangers, etc. And lastly, this beautiful uh, psalm, uh, known as the hymn to the creator, uh, which we hadn't seen before, uh, but now occurs in the 11Q Psalms scroll. Great and holy are you, O Lord, the most holy from generation to generation. In front of him walks glory and behind him the din of many waters. Kindness and truth are around his face. Truth, uprightness and justice are the base of his throne. He separated light from darkness, the dawn he established with the knowledge of his heart. Then all his angels saw and sang, for he showed them what they hadn't known. He crowns the mountains with produce, perfect nourishment for all the living. Blessed be he who made the earth with his strength, who established the world um, with his wisdom. With his knowledge, he spread out the heavens and brought out the wind from his storehouses. Lightning flashes he made for the rain and made the fogs go up from the end of the something. So what do we have? We've got a very rich resource of Jewishness from the late second temple period. Uh, before the scrolls, we knew very little in Hebrew and Aramaic from the time of Hillel. But now we've got a new landscape, which I think needs to be taken into account as we understand things such as the vitality of texts as they are transmitted within Jewish communities. The scrolls are much more representative of what was taking place broadly within Jewish practice at the time. They're not just sectarian and to be put on the edges of Jewish life. They cannot and should not be ignored either by historians of antiquity or members of faith communities. And if you want to find out more about the scrolls, do go to the Orion website, which you can see a screenshot of here, where there is a lot of information, a fantastically searchable bibliography of uh, 10,000 items on the scrolls and information about where you can find Hebrew, Aramaic and Greek texts plus translations and other resources. You can even take a virtual trip of Qumran. And if you want more truth, go to these two books, which my wonderful colleague, Philip Alexander, advertised for me at the very outset. Thank you for your attention.